to bring attention to this issue and try to support you people in this room. So um, I've got a few more months on that film, and I hope that uh, I hope it comes out, and I hope you're proud of it. Thank you. Ooh, you want to go with the ESPN? Go ahead. We'll have two networks competing. <laughs> Do a better job. <laughs> you did well. Thank, Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to be sincere. Well, no, you did well. well you did real well. Um, I'm Patrick Ruby, and uh, like I was introduced, uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm actually working on a piece for ESPN about George, but uh, I also write for a lot of other outlets. Um, I've written for Yahoo Sports. I've written for The Atlantic. Uh, I have my day jobs actually with the Washington Times in DC. Um, and I've been writing about this issue of brain trauma in football um, from a lot of different angles uh, for more than almost about two years now. Um, was very close to writing a book about it. It kind of fell through, but I just sort of continued with my reporting because I feel like it's incredibly important culturally. I, probably for everybody in this room, it's something you're, you're familiar with either personally or you're familiar with friends, or it's something that's near and dear to you. But I have to say, when you're out there in the larger culture, I'm surprised at how little awareness there is of this still, and how much denial, frankly, that there is of these issues. Um, that's something that is personally disturbing to me. That kind of fuels my desire to report on this, to learn more about it, to try to get it out there. Um, and it's particularly upsetting to me at sort of the youth football level which is basically you're dealing with a population, uh, it's by far the most number of people playing football, are kids. These are by far the most vulnerable people playing football, whether you're talking about their brains not being fully developed and being more susceptible to brain damage, whether you're talking about the sort of medical resources that are there to treat them, whether you're talking about sort of the things that are in place to protect them. Th these are by far the most vulnerable people and it's an, actually an issue that really isn't getting still, and I think, enough attention. Um, I actually was in Boston yesterday at Anne McKee's Brain Bank um, looking, at, uh, looking at slides of a, of a kid uh, from my area near D.C. His name is Austin Trinum, 17-year-old kid, one of these like, really special kids who's like, super popular in school, great student, loving family, loving community, everything going for him, planning his future, uh, gets concussed on a Friday night in a game, goes to the hospital, checked out, he's okay, goes and sees his friend, spends a weekend fishing, going to a concert with his girlfriend, uh, hanging out with some friends, doing some homework. Sunday afternoon, goes up to his room, hangs himself. Never had depression. No, none, none of the normal indicators of suicide. <laughs> Parents are devastated. Little brothers are devastated. The community is devastated. You know, it turns out he was brain damaged from his concussion. It turns out the areas in his frontal lobe that deal with impulse control um, were damaged. I mean, you can see it on the slides. You can see where, you know, these axons in the brain that they should look like basically like fiber optic smooth cables running next to each other, they're all twisted and broken. And, you know, science can't say definitively that's why he killed himself, but all the circumstantial evidence, I mean, you can make the, a really good case that that's what happened. And he's not alone. There are other cases of this, and it's not just football players, too. I mean, we're talking about other hockey players, we're talking about wrestlers, soccer players, um, and we're also talking about a lot of our young people that are in the military. This is like a big, and you know, Ann McKee at the Brain Bank in Boston, she works for the VA. This is a, a big and sort of growing problem for the military. Brain trauma concussions are the signature wound of our current wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And so all of this is kind of coming to a head, and, but yet it's still, in my opinion, it's not being talked about enough, and when I, talk to people about what I'm working on, just regular people who are curious, my friends, people I know, older people, I mean, they haven't heard of almost any of this stuff. It's kind of amazing, you know, when you work, like when I work for, do stuff for ESPN, I'm around these people that are hyper into sports, and so they hear about all this stuff, but out in sort of the bigger culture, people really don't know. And that's really dangerous, and so 
I'm really motivated to try to just get a lot of this out there so that people can at least start having discussions so that parents can make more informed decisions, so that kids can make more informed decisions about do they want to play the sport? If so, how do you make it safer? What do you need to do? Um, last little bit about denial, and this goes back to sort of what a lot of you are dealing with. Um, I've also written a lot about sort of what the NFL has done and failed to do on this issue, particularly over the last, until very recently, until they were shamed before Congress, basically. But over, over the last decade, especially with their concussion committees, the things they failed to do. Um, just from the stuff that's been publicly made available, I think it's pretty egregious, personally. Um, my parents are scientists, and so I sort of know how that world works. And some of the stuff the NFL's concussion committee seems to have tried to pull in terms of discrediting some of the science, I mean, to me, is personally kind of outrageous, and I've tried to write about that. I've tried to make that come more to light. Again, most people are not aware of the stuff at all. Like, you talk to them about it, it's like a blank, what, really? I didn't know that. Um, I don't want to talk too much longer, but I will, I will say that, uh, you know, I'm curious to get all of your thoughts on this. Uh, I think one of the factors that is going on here, Sean, you probably see this, Connor, you probably see this, is that there is so much cultural importance placed on football. There is so much love of football in our culture. And not just the pro level, not just the college level, but the youth level. I think it actually sort of makes it harder for people to realize what's currently going on. And that, that can have some really damaging and devastating impacts on people and on their families. So that's where I'm coming from. Can I, can I follow up with one, with one quick point? Uh, when I interviewed um, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, she right. likened this situation, uh, as far as the NFL's denial of it, to the, the, to, to the tobacco industry. And my response to her was that the difference between the tobacco industry and football is that the tobacco industry, it tastes like tobacco. And in our culture, football tastes like ice cream. So it is harder for people to wrap their heads around that because it is, I mean, I know the stuff that you know, but on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday, I'm watching it too. I just watch it differently now than I used to. Well, thank you, and I, and I do appreciate you both being here. It uh, it's really helps us understand that there are other people out there in the public and in the media that certainly uh, help us. I find it somewhat strange that they invited me up here to talk about um, bounties. <laughs> um, I did have somewhat of a re reputation back in those days. There are a few things I want to talk about. And, and I might need some clarifications either from um, John Hogan or even um, Ron Mix. You know, when, when we got out of the league, we had, what, te a 10-year window to file for disability? Was that what it was, 10 years, from your last game you played? I think it was seven. It was seven? Well, I, I, well let's just stick with 10 here. Uh, just an instance with myself. I, I got in about my eighth year, I decided to file for disability. And they had told me that, um, well, we want you to see these doctors. So I went to see the doctors. They said, well, yeah, yeah, you, you're disabled. They sent it to the committee. They tabled it. About eight months later, nine months later, they came back to me and they said, um, well, we want you to see these other doctors, get another opinion. Well, I got another opinion. And they said I was disabled and went back to the committee. They tabled it again. And then they sent me, they, then they decided a year later to fly me to New York to see their league physician. And that, by that time, I had my knee replaced. And he said, well, your knee's bad. You probably need the other knee done. You are disabled, but you had this one fixed. But you're disabled. They sent it back to the committee. Well, the committee met 10 years and two months later. It was uh, since I retired. They said, well, you're two months too late. <laughs> you don't qualify anymore. <laughs> Uh, and, and that's the games they play. You know, what I found out about the whole process is that the union, you would think that when you're filing a disability claim, was there to help you perfect your claim. They did nothing but hamper me. They sent me original documents for total and permanent disability, which I didn't really know the difference, that there was no possible way I was going to get total and permanent. It should be regenerated or, you know, arthritis and things of that nature. There was no way I was, so they did everything possible to make sure that I wouldn't qualify. In fact, Mickey Yaris, in my, in my case, certainly 
is somewhat of a criminal with her fiduciary responsibility. She did everything, every time I talked to her, kept telling me, take your pension. This is at 45 years old. Take your pension. It pays more than what you're going to get in disability, and you can't get them both. She constantly tried to get me to take my pension early, which I didn't, fortunately. So it was kind of like I had Jerry Spence. I don't know if you're lawyers, you probably know who Jerry Spence is. He's a good friend of mine out in Wyoming. He did the Silkwood case, the movie Silkwood, and Kern McGee, and he's made millions of dollars, written about five or six books. And he said, let, let me tell you something. I was at his office in Jackson Hole. He said, let me call the union right now. Now, Jerry Spence, if you're a, a legal expert and Jerry Spence is on the phone, someone would want to really talk to him, OK? He's well known throughout the world. 45 minutes, he was transferred four times and never talked to anyone. He hung the phone up and said, that's exactly what you're going to get, the help you're going to get from the union. He said, uh, I'm somewhat embarrassed to even tell you that. He said, because once you quit playing, they really don't care for you anymore because you can't do anything for them. So I kind of look at what's going on today as what's going on with the government today. And I don't want to get politically incorrect, but I have a you know, tendency to do that. As you know, the NFL is like the president, and the union is like the Congress. Well, the Congress is only going to pass laws that benefit them, such as the health bill. They don't have to go with the same health bill as they're trying to make the rest of us take. So what is happening here is this is why we are trying to get our own representation as a retired players union for one simple reason. When they go into negotiations with the union, the owner's got to give up something and the union's got to give up something. They got chips on the table. Well, what do you think the first chip the union's going to give up? Well, let's give up the retired players. Let's move on to something else so we can have your chip move over to our side here. You give us this, we'll give you the retired players, we won't do anything. Now, if we had our own representation, which a lot of law firms are trying to put together right now, that would be a, that would be a plus for the owners because they could take that chip away from the union and the union would have to give something else up. And we would be able to direct our funding and our programs ourselves without the interference of the NFLPA. Now, first of all, I want to say I appreciate everyone being here, especially the law firms and the legal representatives that have come here on their own dime to help us understand. But I think we have a fiduciary responsibility. We have a responsibility to ourselves and to our fellow teammates to bring this message back to them. You know, it's been this way throughout life and throughout the NFL culture that a lot of us have to do the heavy lifting, carry the water, carry the buckets down, and other people reap the rewards. Well, I. That's fine. That's why we're doing it, because living is giving. So you've got to take this message back. I'll probably field in the next month 50 phone calls from different people saying, what happened? It would be nice if they were here so they could find it out themselves. I've told people before about, you know, you know, you got to file for workers' compensation in California. They said, well, that's a long ways to go and stuff like that, or I, I don't feel well enough to do that. I told them about the legacy fund that we were going for a percentage and not a set figure, because that set figure was really smart of the owners, because that's a set figure for 10 years, whereas their income will go up. If we had gotten a percentage, that $50 million could have been, by the 10th, by the 10th year, $100 million a year. Well, they settled for it, and a lot of players said, well, you know, I'm getting $900 more a month. That's more than I had before. I'm pretty happy. Well, that's not the point. The point is you only get two or three times to go after certain things, such as they talk about the concussions. There's no evidence of it. Well, I dare say that, you know, when you're a boxer, the object of that game is to avoid contact. Where in football, the object of our, our game is to have contact on every single play. Why don't they just par parade Muhammad Ali in front of the crowd and say, hey, this is what head trauma does. I mean, that's a pretty good example. You don't have to have a lot of studies done on that. It's just evidence right in front of you. So these are things we got to take back to him. I remember uh, Bill Bidwell and Brig Owens, who was, a, is, who was an agent in Washington, D.C., he used to sit on the disability board. And he told me that Bill Bidwell said one time when they were hearing one case, they said, well, this, they said, well he can't work. Bill said, yeah, he can work. He's in, a, he's in a wheelchair, but he can still work. Anyone can work. He said, you know, they got newsstands in New York. He can sell pencils and newspapers on the sidewalk. He just doesn't want to work. He's just trying to get free money from us. And he was denied. And that came right up. Of course, Briggs said I couldn't use, you know, tell him who it came from, but I really don't care. Uh, now they're talking about, you know, uh, I'm just really upset that, you know, a lot of you guys, you know, think it's all about the, NF, uh, about the owners. I'm not on the owner's side, but I do know one thing. It's just business to them. It's just business. 
They have this union they have to deal with. And anything they can keep away from the union, they can keep in their own pockets. So it's simply just business. Our representation that we have, that's a chip they play. They always throw us under the bus so they can get more their way. So the thing is, our fight is with the union more so than the owners. The owners would like to just negotiate just with us because that would take a chip away from the union and they would have it on their side. We would be better served by representing ourselves. So getting down to the bounty part of it right now. And another thing, you know, the lawyers might want to actually add something to this. I don't think a lot of the people understand the difference between a class action and a mass action. So I wish we would have had an open forum to explain that to them because the mass action exposes the NFL to a hell of a lot more than a class action. Am I correct in saying that, Ron, John? Well, yeah, I, I, I know, maybe, maybe not, depending on how the judge would basically decide on, you know, whether he wants to, you know, merge it all together or whatever. But I would think that a mass action, individual cases of two or 3,000 players would cost a lot more in legal fees than a class action. Um, well, mass action is a personal injury, isn't it? Is that, is that what it is? Some lawyer can... Is, similar to every other person that was in that class or group. Uh, yes, there are class actions where you can recover personal injury benefits, but those benefits are capped. Whereas in a mass action, the sky really is the limit. It is just like if you slipped and fell at a grocery store or were injured at the hands of somebody else in a malpractice case or anything of that nature ask for everything from economic damages to future economic to pain and suffering, lots of consortium for your spouse, uh, past medicals, future medicals. That is all personal injury damages and that's the difference. At the end of the day, in a mass action, even though there's a list of dozens of names that are on the lawsuit, the claims against the defendants are similar, but the individual nature of the claims and injuries by the plaintiffs are different and separate. I hope that answered the question. If you've got any more, I'll be here. Sure. Jason, isn't it true that if you want to become part of this mass action, you physically have to sign up, unlike some class action, you can be part of a class without signing up. That's a lot of players. Sure, they realize a, that unless they physically sign up, they're not part. Sure, there's a lot of ethical concerns on the part of a lawyer as to how to go and handle those types of things. In a personal injury lawsuit, you need to go seek out a lawyer and join. That would be a mass action. In a class action, you should assume that your rights are covered. At some point during the process of a class action, you may receive an opt-in or an opt-out letter. Some of you guys uh, probably, guys or girls I should say, in this room probably at some point or another got a letter in the mail. Uh, you purchased a Chevy vehicle. There was something that was wrong with the Chevy vehicle. Do you wish to join in? And you sign and join in. And, and that's how you join a class action. Or you can opt out. Um, you probably heard the story recently about the Honda vehicles where somebody opted out of the class action and actually brought their own claim in front of the district magistrate, John, that was the story, and ended up getting, what was it, like $10,000 or something, and everybody else got a coupon for $700 that were in the class action. So that's the difference. Thank you. Thank you very much. And, and that's the information you want to bring back to the people that aren't here. Okay? They, they need to know the difference. Uh, you know, as, as my, my first wife, who is a uh, uh, psychologist for the state of Wyoming, she used to do um, uh, classes for when she was going through college there for the uh, football players where they had to do study halls. And I said, did I learn anything? She said, well, I don't know, but, you know, we, we figured we can lead a horse to water, but we can't make him drink, but we can make him sit there long enough until he gets thirsty. Uh, so it's the same way here. We've got to bring this information back. 
You know, I'm not going to go through any of my injuries because it's well documented. I've had nine knee replacements. But, you know, as I get older, you know, uh, uh, to, to get with Ron Mix, I got to throw in some humor, too. I think I might be getting stronger because it used to be when I got a Woody, I couldn't bend it, but now I can, so. <laughs> <laughs> Either, either it's my shoulder or my strength, one or the other. <laughs> but uh, going back to this now, they want to talk about bounties. You know, what, what I found strange about that interview that Coach did uh, on talking about the bounties there is it doesn't bode well for him as a coach. Because first of all, what he was telling his team is, we're not good enough coaches to put together a defense that can stop these guys. And second of all, you guys aren't good enough with playing the game to stop them legally. So we got to do something illegal to get these guys out of the game. Now, they think it's something new. I mean, I did Miller Lite commercials uh, for years, and they made up these postcards with us. And on the postcard, Phil Villapiano had told me. And John Madden, of course, was one of the leaders of the Miller Lite commercials. He said, the Raiders, we had a $100 bounty on you. So anyone that could knock you out of the game. Yeah, they never got it done, though. But if that wasn't true, then John Madden would have certainly said, hey, wait a minute, you can't have that on there. Of course, John Madden's the same guy that's made $100 million off the uh, video games already. I talked to Phil and I said, you know, we really need you to testify to this, that you heard that and stuff, if this ever comes up in the concussion cases and stuff. Of course, you got to understand one thing, once a Raider, always a Raider. Oh, These guys no. will, <laughs> okay, they won't, they won't turn on their own. I put a knife foundation in this bag. You know, okay. <laughs> You well, have to dig deep for that one. So uh, you have to you'll have to dig deep for that one. They said to put a knife in his back. Uh, uh, but anyway, uh, th that's not an insult to you. That was a humor that he's dead. <laughs> but um, that was humor. <laughs> I don't want to set Dave off. He'll get on a rampage. Bounties. You know, we didn't have bounties. You know, when when I played, we didn't have bounties at all. We and and Bob will uh, agree to this. You know, if you would. Man enough to give a cheap shot, you better be man enough to take him. And if some guy was being a jerk off to one of our quarterback or to one of our running backs or something of that nature, we would sit there and say, hey, let, let's get the guy. And what that meant is any time you get a chance and he's standing around, knock him on his ass. Not tear his knee up, not break his neck off. It's knock him down. And, it, it, and we would go after people like that, or we would find out. We'd play him another time in the, in the season. When we go out there, we'd, anytime you, know, you get a chance, give them a shot. It wasn't to injure them. It was just to let them know, hey, man, you, know, you did wrong to us. It's like, like in baseball. If a pitcher hits a batter from one team, the pitcher from the other team's got to hit a batter of theirs. That's just the way it is, and that's the way the game is played. But putting bounties up and giving money out for it, um, and, and the speech the guy made is, uh, puts a real bad mark on a sport that is a beautiful game. And unfortunately, the game is, is somewhat changed a lot. And I've had a, a real good friend of mine who's a national broadcaster and said he doesn't know how many more years he can do it because the game has completely changed from what he is used to talking about. It doesn't resemble anything of how the game used to be played. He said, most of the guys with these hits you see on the field, with the concussions, they're simply there for the, the, the highlight film on ESPN or HBO. They, they want to make the, uh, the great hits of the day or the great hit vi video. And if you watch those hits most of the time, they're doing more damage to the other guy that's trying to tackle them than they are doing with the, with the guy with the hoochie, the guy with the, carrying the football. So bounties are going to work their own way out, and concussions are a real big part of the game. And the thing is, as Mike Dicka said, it's not a contact sport, it's a collision sport. And the players are getting bigger and faster and stronger, and the body isn't made to carry 350, 390 pounds. And because of that weight, and it's just physics, there's going to be more and more injuries down the road. They're actually taken very good care of. So it's our job as players, people that took the time out to come down here, and hey, listen, I really appreciate all the legal people, Ron Mix, John Hogan, all of you that came down here to help us. And I hope you all get paid, because if you get paid, then all the other retired players that need the help are going to get paid too, and you certainly deserve it. And I appreciate the time. I appreciate all the help I've gotten from John Hogan, from Ron Mix, from uh, the Bartimus Law Firm in uh, Kansas City. And uh, I can't say enough. And of course, 
you know, Dave Parrott does a great job trying to keep everyone informed. <coughs> Thank you very much, and um, I guess we're about ready to go to lunch here, aren't we? Can I follow up a few things you just said? Sure. Okay. Um, the bounty issue itself, I think it goes uh, a lot deeper than the idea that we're not good enough, so we're going to let these guys do this. I think that um, what happened in that room, uh, it was about power and control. Uh, much the way sexual harassment is who's in charge. Um, in that room, it was said over and over that we brought you here for a reason, okay? Most of these guys make league minimum, so it's implied you better do this or you're out of your job. I don't think it's about his job and him telling them that they're not good enough. He's telling them, you better do it the way I say or you'll lose your, get, you'll lose your job. Oh, no, I, I totally agree with you on that. But I'm, what I'm also saying is the mentality, the other side of the coin is, <laughs> why would you have to say that if you had belief in your system and your players to get the job done? Well, one of the reasons why I came out with what I came out with was that in the aftermath of him doing that, he said we knew what we were doing was wrong. Um, as someone who was in that room, it was clear that the we was I. There was no we in that at all. So that's one of the reasons why I put that out, because there was the assumption that these players were complicit in this act, and that's just not true. They were, in a sense, because they were doing his bidding, but they wanted to keep their jobs. They wanted to keep their jobs. They wanted to stay employed. And many people in their 20s would make that same decision. So I felt that he then did them a huge disservice. He threw them under the bus. And I think part of the reason why um, you know, he had that opportunity to repair his image with a year of some sort of community service through the NFL and talking to people. Um, I think that was ridiculous. I think that was, I think that was utterly, utterly ridiculous. Someone who, you know, um, asks people to do that to somebody else should not have a job. The fact is they said uh, he deserves a second chance. A lot of players are saying, well, he deserves a second chance. Well, this was going on for three years. He already got his second chance. He got his third chance. And what I've seen in the last two years in shooting basically peewee to the pros, it trickles down. It trickles down. So I've seen coaches at every level treat kids as if they're going to do my bidding. You know, down 30 to nothing at halftime. I don't care about the score. Lay some hat. These kids are 12, 13 years old. I, I remember I coached, uh, I was the head coach at our Catholic school for eight years, all the way from flag football all the way to contact football. And my, my main main goal for every year is trying to get through the year with no injuries. But we would play some teams and I'd hear the parents in sixth and seventh grade yelling out, stand him up and get his knees. And I was appalled by that. I remember one time I went into the huddle and told them, listen, you know, we were getting beat. And I said, I want you guys to go out there and, and take care of these guys, bloody their noses. <laughs> okay. I mean, I don't mean bloody their nose. I mean, play tough that you would bloody the, the, the official one in the house says, hey, don't listen to your coach. <laughs> don't, don't do that. Uh, so I thought that was quite, uh, quite amusing. But I wasn't making it as that, that he was telling his team that they're not good enough. I was insulting him because in his mind, he probably felt we have to do more than what you're doing now. I was just reacting to the fact that I think that it's been covered on a very superficial level. I think Patrick made a great point in that uh, people really aren't paying attention to this issue because their fascination and fixation with football. I also believe that, um, you know, because of this, uh, people are just turning a blind eye to all of it. You know, they say that you guys made your money. Well, the fact is, you all know, you didn't make that much money. But they're making a lot of money today, which is a big reason why they don't pay attention to it, which is a big reason why the networks don't talk about it. Well, the, the other thing is, and I apologize, but the other thing is that you, you got to understand that the public, how many times most of us have been on some strikes that we always thought we'd get public sympathy? Well, you know what they say you can find sympathy in the dictionary, right between syphilis and shit. The point of the matter is the public has got their own problems, okay? And they automatically think that we're just a bunch of overpriced, highly paid people, that I'm out here working 12 hours days, six days a week, and I didn't have nothing to bitch about. So public sympathy is difficult to garner when you're a professional athlete. That's why we have to do it through the law firms. We have to take advantage of, of mass action, class actions, because until you bring them up in front of a court of law, law, 
as a businessman, they're going to do what they can do and what they can get away with. And that's why these guys spend a lot of years honing their skills to fight the injustices. And so I applaud them, and I applaud you all for being here for this conference so we can take this message back to you other people so when something's settled and they're not on that mass action, they can't come up to you and say, I didn't know anything about it. Well, get informed. I'm sorry. No, that's per actually, that's a, no, I, uh, the thing is, <laughs> I, I have to interrupt. Give him the microphone. I, I have to interrupt because I don't know what the hell I was going to say. Okay, <laughs> just kidding. Look, no, it's a perfect segue, actually, because something else I, I want to just kind of communicate to all of you, we're talking you know, about football culture. In some ways, it's ridiculous that I'm here talking about football culture on stage when all of you are the football players. Um, but something that's really important for what all of you are trying to accomplish, whether it's as a group or whether it's individually, whether it's with your own health, whether it's getting justice for, for your cause, is engaging with the, non, the larger non-football culture. And, and sometimes I think from being inside football culture, it actually can hamstring all of you in engaging with that larger culture. Um, and what do I mean by that? I mean, you know, football culture, from everything I observe and see, from everything people like you have told me for a long time, it is all about, it's not sucking it up. It's about physical courage. It's, it's about, you know, you taking the playing in pain. And those are all admirable things, and that's a big part of why non-football culture enjoys and finds football culture entertaining. Um, it, but it also can boomerang on you. I mean, you look at this sort of the fan's attitude within football culture, look at any story that gets posted online about ex-players that are involved in lawsuits. What do you see? You see the majority of the comments are people, why are these guys complaining? It's like what Conrad just they said. They knew what, the risks. Yeah, they knew the risks. What, what, what is this? And if you even look at stuff with high school football and the things I was talking about, with, with it being you know, dangerous in ways that we weren't aware of in the past, the same attitude. What's the big deal here? Hey, I played football. I tore up my knee, whatever. What, I'm fine. Why, why are people being such wusses now about it? That's football culture. But what that leads to is inertia. That leads to things staying exactly the way they already are. And when you guys go out and you engage with non-football culture, it's different. And if you can, like you brought up the tobacco lawsuit analogy, things like that are, are a perfect way to engage with non-football culture. If you tell people, hey, you know, what went on with the NFL and their concussion committee? There's a lot of parallels to what I went on with tobacco. All of a sudden, they're like, whoa, wait a second, really? Tell me more, because that's something they understand. It's something that's outside of football culture, but it helps bridge that gap. If you uh, are talking about these workman's comps issues, and, and you're running into this attitude of like, what, you knew the risks, what's the big deal? And you're like, well, hey, what if you worked in an asbestos factory, and you know it's dangerous, um, not that there are still asbestos factories, but you know, or you work in a coal mine, right? You know you're taking some risk, but then at the same time, that coal mine is violating all these rules they're supposed to be following, and they're not taking care of people that get hurt on the job. People will be like, oh, okay, I see your point. You're taking it again, you're taking it, you're relating the non-football culture to the football culture. Same thing with, with youth football. You know, I, I don't, I'm not here to tell you whether there should or shouldn't be peewee football, youth football. I have some personal opinions about that. I can talk to you about it privately if you like from a scientific perspective, but in terms of making it safer, you know, if you tell someone, hey, would you, uh, would you have a high school boxing team? Or talk to a mother and say, hey, you know, do you want your 10-year-old son to be involved in MMA right now, full contact MMA? They look at you like you're fucking crazy, right? Excuse my language, but that's what they look at you. <laughs> right, and, and if you say, well, look, there's a lot of similar risks going on in youth football right now. We need to do something about them. We need to at least try to reduce this risk. We need to have a conversation about whether this is worth it for our kids. You're taking football culture and you're merging it into non-football culture, and people actually understand. And you start to open their eyes. And so, you know, I would just advise all of you to, uh, you know, be aware of sometimes, you know, like I said, your, your own mindset from what you've learned and what you've been conditioned to learn in the game, it, it's what people really admire about you, but sometimes it can actually work against you. You know, I, I can add to that, and I find that someone, I'm in the nurse staffing business, so I supply nurses to hospitals, and I also do uh, flu vaccinations across the country for large corporate customers. But, you know, 
when they say you knew the risk, and we didn't know, well, we didn't know the risk because when you're 21 years old, you're bulletproof. You know, you 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 you're bigger than anything else around. That injuries happen to other people; they don't happen to us. But you know, when I have a nurse in the hospital and she sticks herself with a needle and has to be tested for AIDS or something like that, and she ends up getting workers' comp, I have to pay for it. And I bought my own office building. I didn't have the city build one for me. You know, I probably employ a lot more people than the Kansas City Chiefs do in Kansas City, but I don't get any tax relief or, or help from them. And I think that's the biggest problem I have with the, uh, with the NFL is, is the benefits that they achieve or get from the citizens of the cities they're located in, and then they turn around and dump their players on the payrolls of the Medicare, workers' comp, everything else, and wash their hands of it. I have to pay the taxpayers. I have to pay my fair share. I have to take care of my employees. They should have to do the same. So the thing is, every occupation you have, there's risk involved in it. Whether you work in high-rise buildings, there's a risk you could fall off. Whether you're a nurse and get stuck with a needle or end up getting TB because you walked into the wrong room without a mask on, there's risk in that. So I don't bode that argument or, or, or even look at those people that say, well, you knew the risk. Well, everyone knows the risk. But does that's, that was my occupation. That's what I did for a living. You guys didn't know the risk, though, because in 2002 is when chronic traumatic encephalopathy was worse, first yes. discovered in, Michael, in, uh, in Mike Webster. And the fact is they knew this, which is the, 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 um, the, the, the basis of all these lawsuits. So they knew the risks. Had, there has to be a line of demarcation there. Because the also the modern players, they should know the risks, but a lot of them don't even know what chronic traumatic encephalopathy is. That's a fact. I've interviewed a bunch of them, but the public throws you all in the same, all in the same bunch. If I could just say this, the NFL had a mild traumatic brain committee group, and the person that headed it up, his name was Ira Casson, and when he was asked about does getting hit in the head cause brain damage, he said no. Does getting hit in the head cause early onset dementia? He says, no. He says, is there any type of brain damage these players receive? And he stopped for a second and he says, playing football? No. And he was asked one other question about brain damage. We named him Dr. No instead of Ira Casson. And the dude left town. Now where is he? I don't know. Yeah, he's a good guy. But when he stepped down, Roger Goodell said, uh, talked about what a great job he did and how he was going to continue to lead the, uh, this new, uh, this, uh, the committee on brain injuries because he'd done such a wonderful job. Well, when the heat got turned up even higher, he like vanished. And what the league did is they says, okay, what we'll do now is we'll give it a different name. So now it's not the mild traumatic brain injury. We'll call it the Head, Neck, Back, Spine Committee. So the NFL knew. They just didn't tell us. In fact, they paid some quack doctor to violate his Hippocratic Oath for a few football tickets and maybe a couple pictures with Roger Goodell. You know, uh, so, you know so, so I'm not, I'm not quite okay. finished yet. So the question is, who's culpable? A bunch of 21-year-old kids or 32 billionaires? You know, I, I just wanted to add one thing. You know, they have that, they, they have that um, what is continuing care plan now for, you know, players, you know, if you, if you need to go into a nursing home or something like that that the NFL put out there. Long -term yeah, long-term care. Well, <laughs> I found out that a lot of the players that are, you know, 68, 70, uh, I mean, uh, Fred Urbanis was turned down, uh, Bobby Ply was turned down. Man, because they think you're going to have the mentor and you're actually going to use it. So <laughs> they denied them. <laughs> I mean, if you, don't, if you don't apply for it, you know, in your 50s or 60s, you aren't going to, not, you're not, if you're 70 or 75, you're not getting it. If I may make a, make a quick point. Am I right? I think one of the main issues here, we're talking culpability. <laughs> is that in, in 2002, when, when Mike Webster died, you know, homeless in his, in his truck, 
in the same town that, that his family lived in. Now, I, I speak with his son, Garrett, on a regular basis. Dr. Benin Omalo received his brain and did the very first study. And, and Bennett, Bennett and I, and I meet with Bennett regularly. And Bennett did the study on his brain, and he couldn't understand. Bennett's from Africa. didn't even understand American football. And he told me this personally. He said, I thought it was just a bunch of big, fat guys running into each other. But he heard stories about Mike Webster, who was somewhat of an American hero, Hall of Famer. And he couldn't understand how this man died homeless in his truck in the same town his family lived in. He could not never find his way home. And he studied that brain and studied it and studied it. So much so that he said they were making fun of him at work. He was the head corner at the uh, uh, head corner pathologist in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. He took the brain home in a Tupperware tub and continued to send out samples and samples. And he was the first one to discover the tau protein. And he told me personally, he said, George, when I wrote that first paper, a scientific paper that he had published in 2002, he said, I thought the NFL would come to me as a hero that I discovered something. They squelched his study. He said they called him the most unbelievable names. The next brain he got, Justin Strzelczynski, I can't pronounce Strzelczyk. it right. Okay. 37-year-old yeah. Pittsburgh Steeler kills himself. Omalo gets his brain, same thing, full of tau protein. He writes another paper. That's squelched. Andre Waters, 41 years old, kills himself. He gets that brain, full of tau protein. Omalo writes another paper. They squelch his studies for years. The first 20, 23 of the first 24 brains that Bennett looked at and from NFL players all had tau protein. Now, tau protein had never been seen before other than in Alzheimer's victims and, and older people. It, it's fairly common. But to have it come out, so the big, the big point, for me at least, is that the NFL knew clear back in 2002 and they squelched, they squelched these studies for years when more and more guys were dying and killing themselves, and the NFL knew it. And I think this, that is where this all goes to. There are doctors that could stand up there and say, no, you can beat someone in the head, it's not going to cause any brain damage, and repeatedly say that. There, there's, no, there's no question that they knew what was going on. And so I think the big point is we need to educate the public that we were told it was okay. I have videos we'll sh we could show today. My very first play with the 49ers. Very first play. I get drilled, major concussion. They told me afterwards I went through 20 or 25 smelling salts. During the game, I'd come out, give me a couple, clear my head, go back in. Okay, never missed a play, never missed a practice. Okay. You mean to tell me boxers get knocked unconscious and they're done? We as football players, it was just, hey, get his head clear, put him back in. Now, how is it that boxing commission knew that, that knockouts were dangerous to continue to play, but the football commission didn't know this? So I think this is what we get down to. You don't depend on a player, a 21, 22-year-old, you know, we would have done anything to play. Sure, we're going to say we're good. Do they ask you, hey, you good to go? Yeah, I'm good. Hell yeah, put me back in. So that's where we get in. We get into this cultural issue, and we get into the culpability of what did they know? And they knew damn good and well a long time ago. And I didn't mean to go random. No, can I follow that with one, with one point? Sure. Um, I'm very familiar with, familiar with what you talked about. Uh, yeah, they discredited him to a huge degree. Uh, there are two other, there's a book uh, that is escaping me right now, the name of it, but it was published in 1999, and the editors were Julian Bales, and then two guys from the um, University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, uh, Mark Level and uh, Joseph Maroon. And on the first page in chapter three in that book, they talked about uh, dementia pugilistica in boxers knowing that it was existing in the 1920s. On that, on that page, they said it was a foreseeable eventuality in American football. So bef three years before CTE was found in Mike Webster's brain, these guys felt it was gonna be happening. And Joseph Maroon was a, neuro a team neurologist for the Pittsburgh Steelers for quite a long time. And I have a friend who played for that team who said he had no idea who that guy even was. That friend right now is suffering from very severe post-concussion syndrome, went through it for two years. So they knew. They knew. Dr. Bales now is on Dr. Uh, Benner Mall. They have a whole um, 
foundation building. On. He's on his board. Mm -hmm. He's one of the good guys. Okay. So, I'm not saying he's a bad guy. I'm just saying that of, there were three people who edited that book, and they knew about it. Right. Yeah. And the thing is, they knew back in the 20s. All right. Yeah. I mean, I mean, they're studying. They, they're very they knew about boxing in the twenties. Yeah. Didn't get the head causes brain damage in the twenties. Mm -hmm. So these law firms, what they've been doing is, is they've been creating this convoluted scheme of how they're going to just, you know, get through this. Okay. Now it's come to a head, and now they're going to see if these lawyers they paid all this money to, if they covered them well enough. I believe part of the reason why. Uh, Another friend of mine asked me this question. He said, if the Saints won the Super Bowl this year, how likely is it do you think that, that they would have been discredited that way? I think that's a really interesting question. It, would Bounty Gate have even existed if the Saints won the Super Bowl? In a very image conscious league, I think my friend might actually have a pretty decent, uh, a decent you know, uh, idea of that. And also one of the reasons why I released that tape is because I felt players were being discredited to the point that um, the American public would say, see, they do it to themselves. They do it to themselves. So all these guys who are on these lawsuits, they did it to themselves. I firmly believe that. You know, I, I think the public also has got to understand with the retired players that we're not out to destroy the game, okay? But what we are trying to tell the public is, yes, everyone knows what they're getting into, but as a owner of a business, you still have a responsibility to your employees to take care of them. That's all we're saying. Yeah, I need to go to lunch. I, you know, I've got to keep I up know. my weight. That's what I was going to say. I can, hear, I can hear John Hauser's stomach growling from all the way up here. Um, maybe one question from the floor, and then we'll break for lunch. The plan, by the way, is we're going to get back together here a bit before 2 o'clock in the afternoon. And if we can have about 10 minutes or so before 2 o'clock, we'd like to walk around the room or have everybody go up to a microphone and introduce each other so that we all know who, who the participants are. Okay? Uh, about 10, 10 to 2. Okay? And with that, one okay. question. Uh, I just wanted to add, again, in this professional athletic unions, multiple unions, uh, I've been fighting my pension and health with the Screen Actors Guild, and when I went in with paperwork on post-concussion syndrome, their medical expert asked me if I believed that post-concussion syndrome causes depression. I'm not the doctor. He is. If he doesn't know, then he shouldn't even be sitting on the board of trustees making a decision whether I should get a health plan or not. Well, can I make one really fast point? Sure. Yeah. It's fast. Just, just related to that, like when you're dealing, definitely, I'm sure you guys have experienced this when you are dealing with medical people, like they're not all created equal. And I don't mean that as a slight to any of them, but like some people have more recent education than others. I find this a lot dealing with these high school football stories that they're going to ER rooms where people aren't trained in this kind of stuff. They don't know the right protocols for treating concussions. They don't know, they, I mean, they basically, and it's not just in ERs, it's, it's you know, doctors who are 30 years out of medical school, their knowledge is 20 years old on this subject. So you have to, I'm just, I would just caution all of you, you know, make sure you find people that are up to date on their information so you don't run into situations when they're asking you questions. <laughs>
talk to people about what I'm working on, just regular people who are curious, my friends, people I know, older people. I mean, they haven't heard of almost any of this stuff. It's kind of amazing, you know, when you work, like when I work for, do stuff for ESPN, I'm around these people that are hyper into sports, and so they hear about all this stuff. But out in sort of the bigger culture, people really don't know. And that's really dangerous. And so I'm really motivated to try to just get a lot of this out there so that people can at least start having discussions so that parents can make more informed decisions, so that kids can make more informed decisions about do they want to play the sport? If so, how do you make it safer? What do you need to do? Um, last little bit about denial, and this goes back to sort of what a lot of you are dealing with. Um, I've also written a lot about sort of what the NFL has done and failed to do on this issue, particularly over the last, until very recently, until they were shamed before Congress, basically. But over, over the last decade, especially with their concussion committees, the things they failed to do. Um, just from the stuff that's been publicly made available, I think it's somewhat strange that they invited me up here to talk about um, bounties. <laughs> um, I did have somewhat of a re reputation back in those days. There are a few things I want to talk about, and, and I might need some clarifications either from um, John Hogan or even um, Ron Mix. You know, when, when we got out of the league, we had, what, te a 10-year window to file for disability? Was that what it was, 10 years, from your last game you played? Seven. Uh, seven? Well, I, I well, let's just stick with ten here. Uh, just an instance with myself. I I got in about my eighth year. I decided to file for disability, and they had told me that um, well, we want you to see these doctors. So I went to see the doctors. They said, well, yeah, yeah, you you're disabled. They sent it to the committee. They tabled it. About eight months later, nine months later. They came back to me and they said, um, well, we want you to see these other doctors, get another opinion. Well, I got another opinion. And they said I was disabled and went back to the committee. They tabled it again. And then they sent me, they, then they decided a year later to fly me to New York to see their league physician. And that, by that time, I had my knee replaced. And he said, well, your knee's bad. You'll probably need the other knee done. You are disabled, but you had this one fixed, but you're disabled. They sent it back to the committee. Well, the committee met 10 years and two months later, it was, uh, since I retired. They said, well, you're two months too late. <laughs> you don't qualify anymore. Uh, and, and that's the games they play. You know, what I found out about the whole process is that the union, you would think that when you're filing a disability claim, was there to help you perfect your claim. They did nothing but hamper me. They sent me original documents for total and permanent disability, which I didn't really know the difference. To bring attention to this issue and try to support you people in this room. So um, I've got a few more months on that film, and I hope that, uh, I hope it comes out and I hope you're proud of it. Thank you. Boo, you want to go with the ESPN? Go ahead. We'll have two networks competing here. Do a better job. <laughs> you did well. Thank you. <laughs> I was trying to be sincere. Well, no, you did well. well. You did real well. Um, I'm Patrick Ruby, and uh, like I was introduced, uh, I'm here. Uh, I'm actually working on a piece for ESPN about George, but uh, I also write for a lot of other outlets. Um, I've written for Yahoo Sports. I've written for The Atlantic. Uh, I, my day job's actually with The Washington Times in DC. Um, and I've been writing about this issue of brain trauma in football um, from a lot of different angles uh, for more than almost about two years now. Um, was very close to writing a book about it. It kind of fell through, but I just sort of continued with my reporting because I feel like it's incredibly important culturally. I, probably for everybody in this room, it's something you're, you're familiar with either personally uh, or you're familiar with friends or it's something that's near and dear to you. But I have to say when you're out there in the larger culture, I'm surprised at how little awareness there is of this still and how much denial, frankly, that there is of these issues. Um, that's something that is personally disturbing to me. That kind of fuels my desire to report on this, to learn more about it, to try to get it out there. Um, and it's particularly upsetting to me at sort of the youth football level, which is 
pretty egregious personally. Um, my parents are scientists, and so I sort of know how that world works. And some of the stuff the NFL's concussion committee seems to have tried to pull in terms of discrediting some of the science, I mean, to me, is personally kind of outrageous, and I've tried to write about that. I've tried to make that come more to light. Again, most people are not aware of the stuff at all. Like, you talk to them about it, it's like a blank, what, really? I didn't know that. Um, I don't want to talk too much longer, but I will, I will say that, uh, you know, I'm curious to get all of your thoughts on this. Uh, I think one of the factors that is going on here, Sean, you probably see this, Connor, you probably see this, is that there is so much cultural importance placed on football. There is so much love of football in our culture. And not just the pro level, not just the college level, but the youth level. I think it actually sort of makes it harder for people to realize what's currently going on. And that, that can have some really damaging and devastating impacts on people and on their families. So that's where I'm coming from. Can I, can I follow up with one, with one quick point? Uh, when I interviewed um, Congresswoman Linda Sanchez, she right. likened this situation, uh, as far as the NFL's denial of it, to the, the, to, to the tobacco industry. And my response to her was that the difference between the tobacco industry and football is that the tobacco industry, it tastes like tobacco. And in our culture, football tastes like ice cream. So it is harder for people to wrap their heads around that because it is, I mean, I know the stuff that you know, but on Sunday, Monday, and Thursday, I'm watching it too. I just watch it differently now than I used to. Well, thank you, and I, and I do appreciate you both being here. It uh, it's really helps us understand that there are other people out there in the public and in the media that certainly uh, help us. I find it's- Basically, you're dealing with a population. Uh, it's by far the most number of people playing football are kids. These are by far the most vulnerable people playing football, whether you're talking about their brains not being fully developed and being more susceptible to brain damage, whether you're talking about the sort of medical resources that are there to treat them, whether you're talking about sort of the things that are in place to protect them. Th these are by far the most vulnerable people. And it's an, actually an issue that really isn't getting still, and I think, enough attention. Um, I actually was in Boston yesterday at Ann McKee's Brain Bank um, looking, at, uh, looking at slides of a, of a kid uh, from my area near DC. His name is Austin Trenum, 17 year old kid. One of these like really special kids who's like super popular in school, great student, loving family, loving community, everything going for him, planning his future, uh, gets concussed on a Friday night in a game goes to the hospital, checked out, he's okay, goes and sees his friend, spends a weekend fishing, going to a concert with his girlfriend, uh, hanging out with some friends, doing some homework. Sunday afternoon, goes up to his room, hangs himself. Never had depression. No, none, none of the normal indicators of suicide. <coughs> Parents are devastated, little brothers are devastated, the community is devastated. You know, it turns out he was brain damaged from his concussion. It turns out the areas in his frontal lobe that deal with impulse control um, were damaged. I mean, you can see it on the slides. You can see where, you know, these axons in the brain that they should look like basically like fiber optic smooth cables running next to each other. They're all twisted and broken. And 